Hey everyone, welcome to the video. Today's Fantasy Star Online 2 New Genesis video will be about game-changing tips that I wish I knew from the very beginning. This game released about a week ago, and I've been playing it ever since. This video was initially recorded as a live commentary, but I unfortunately forgot to unmute the microphone, so here we are. I'll be jumping right into it with the first tip talking about camera zoom. If you use the numpad by default, the plus sign will zoom you out and the minus sign will zoom you in. The division sign and multiplication sign will move the camera up and down and you can find these options in the option menu under keybind settings for keyboard and set them to whatever you would like. With so much exploration in this game, it's useful to pull up the world map. You can pull your menu up by hitting the escape key on a keyboard, but if you hold it down, same for controller, if you hold the menu button down, it opens up the world map. And then if you press tab, or Y on controller, you can search each area and click on a tab that opens up exactly how much of a collectible you have in each area. You might have noticed sometimes that while jumping and doing a normal attack, this will perform a drop kick, also known as a diving attack. In the gameplay options, you can disable this setting and instead set it to activate only on your sub palette. So following along on screen, select gear slash sub palette, go to sub palette and click any of the available slots and then add diving attack to it. Now by pressing the number two, I activate the diving attack and no longer will randomly drop kick whenever I'm shooting normals and jumping with spacebar. In a similar vein, there is also a setting to disable automatic wall jumping. If you pay attention to my character, I dodge and hold a directional key to activate a photon dash. You can see the particle effects on my feet show that it is active. And then if I jump into a wall and have automatic wall jump on, my character will automatically wall jump. So you can disable this so that if you're touching a wall, you can manually hit the space bar to then perform the wall jump. I believe by default the game has double tap dodging enabled. You can disable this in the same gameplay settings. What double tap dodging is, if you hit a directional key twice, your character will dodge. Instead, I recommend that you set a dodge key. For me, I use shift since that is my crouch button on first person shooter games. The next thing I want to go over is movement mechanics in general because this still trips up some players. So going over all of it, you just simply run around with directional keys, you dodge to activate photon dash, and if you hold your spacebar, you jump higher, but if you hold your spacebar too long, you activate photon glide. So you can double jump and hold the spacebar to activate photon glide after a second jump, or hold spacebar on the first jump, and then double jump out of that. Additionally, wall jump can be used to cut tight corners or save yourself from an otherwise bad jump. But know that there is a landing animation, a roll, and if you roll off of an edge, that can sometimes eat your first jump. So combine all three for the best movement possibilities. Now what I'm about to show you is a pretty difficult jump, so what you want to do is hold the spacebar as long as you possibly can without activating photon glide, and then repeat on the second jump. This is the swift jump cocoon, and it is perfect for practicing your movement options. Note that you can wall jump off of your forehead. You don't have to have your feet on a surface to perform a wall jump. I thought it was important to start out with movement and movement related keybinds because that's how you explore this world and that's what I recommend to new players. The number one question I get is how do I start off optimally? To answer that question, I would say don't overthink it. This game tutorial is significantly better than Fantasy Star Online 2 Classic. So what I advise is that you start the main story and try to progress that as much as you can. When you hit a bottleneck, start doing sub quest and then kill monsters around your level, preferably with other friends. And most importantly, read the text. If you spend just a couple seconds reading what pops up on screen during the main quest and sub quest, it'll answer a lot of questions that would otherwise have you searching on YouTube. I'm going to repeat that for emphasis here. Do the main quest, do the sub quest, kill monsters around your level, read what is on screen. That is how you progress in Fantasy Star Online 2 New Genesis. Another common question I get every single stream without fail is, how do you swap weapons fast? There are three methods to accomplish this. The first being chat commands, the second being your numpad, and the third being creating a multi-weapon. Since I put a metric ton of hours into PSO2 Classic, I'm used to swapping weapons every other attack. But since you're not, just know that it is not necessary to perform well in this game, but it's just an added thing if you want to go that extra mile. So here's how to do it. You go to chat shortcuts and you notice I have some commands there, slash spal and slash mpal. 
SPAL stands for sub pallet, MPAL stands for main pallet, which is also your weapon. So go into the options, go to shortcuts under keybinds, and run chat shortcuts with whatever you see fit. I use the F keys, so if I hit F1 and F2, it switches between sub pallet 1 and sub pallet 2. If I hit F9, it switches to MPAL 3, which is my third weapon. Then, on my number 4, number 5, and number 6 weapon, I use my keyboard software to substitute the tilde, tab, and caps lock key to act as number pad 4, 5, and 6, which would swap my weapon to 4, 5, and 6. Again, this is not an in-game option, this is keyboard software. Finally, the third option to quick swap is to make a multi-weapon. So head to Central City and go to the Item Lab. Make sure you have two weapons of the same weapon series, in this case I'm using the Sivia Rod and the Sivia Launcher. By combining these two, I create a Rod Launcher, and on that Rod Launcher, I can have both Magical Spells and Missile Launcher attacks, and the Rod Weapon action, which is a block, and the Launcher Weapon action, which is a Sticky Bomb. I can have all of that on the same weapon, so it foregoes the need to switch from a Rod to a Launcher, because both weapons are combined. Now with that being said, I want to teach you about item enhancement. I'm going to oversimplify it. By sacrificing weapons into another weapon, you increase the item level. The higher the level, the more damage you do, and you also unlock potentials, which have a variety of effects on the weapon. What I'm really trying to tell you here is that when you get loot out in the wild, you should only keep your eye on two things primarily. The silver prim sword and the gold prim sword, because both of those give you increased EXP whenever you sacrifice them into another weapon. Additionally, Gold Prim Swords can be used to trade for Augmentation Aids, which increase your chances of success on an Augment. And an Augment is just adding a perk to a weapon by spending capsules. You get capsules from killing monsters out in the wild, and some of these capsules can go for a lot of money. So getting an additional 10% on that success rate can severely save some money. For more information on Prim Swords, please check out the video in the description below that goes into this more in depth. I always try to plug fellow PSO2 content creators when they make awesome content, so thank you. Another item out in the wild to keep your eye out for is Sibia Armor, as well as Thesis Armor. Pretty much keep any armor you have that is above 1 stars. So keep your 2 star, keep your 3 star, and keep your 4 star. This will prove useful in the long run whenever you have to upgrade 4 star armor and need a bunch of fodder to sacrifice into it so it gets that plus 40. You might notice that my mouse is hovering over 3 different armor pieces. You can get these for free. Check the description below for Animana's video on where to find the Red Crate Armor. The Red Crate Armor is very useful because it gives you an attack bonus in two of the three attack types. For example, the Belta Armor gives you a 1% boost to range and technique weapons. If you've been following the main story, at some point it tells you to upgrade your battle power in order to progress. You can accomplish this by equipping weapons of a higher rarity and equipping gear that has a higher enhancement level and better perks. This is designed so that when you start doing high level quests, you don't have people in there with very low level gear that aren't really contributing to killing the boss. If you want to know where to farm high level weapons and high level units, please check Azalera's video in the video description below. You don't have to rely on getting weapon drops though. If you're unlucky, you can just buy the weapon directly off the player shop. Keep in mind that the shop search function is broken right now, so you have to type out the weapon itself. In this case, I'm searching Resurger Rifle, which at first glance is probably the best in slot because of its potential, which says that if you sidestep successfully, that means dodge into an enemy attack, it increases the critical hit rate. As a veteran player, I want to advise you guys not to get fixated on having the best at all times. It is very costly to upgrade weapons, so sometimes using a cheaper forces rifle and upgrading it to max is a lot better than burning all your currency, all your Masetta, on obtaining a Resurger Rifle, but not being able to afford the upgrades. As you can see, the Forces Rifle has a potential that says creates a barrier that provides damage resistance 40% when at max HP. And, check this out. I was doing some theory crafting here on running 32 man activities. I'm thinking Forces Rifle might not be bad if you wanna go more the defense meta. So there will be some enemies in the future that have potential to one-shot everybody in the room. And so if you have a Force character or a Tekker character with the Arresta Field Force perk, which heals other players when they use a healing item, if most of your team has Forces weapons, they will survive getting one-shot. And the person who can make sure that everyone doesn't have to heal 
is a technique class. Again, I'm not saying this will definitively be better, but there are options. You have options. You do not have to burn every resource just to have the best in slot and do 2% more damage than the next person. In PSO2, game knowledge goes way farther than gear. You could have somebody who has infinite currency and they will not out damage a veteran player. It's also worth mentioning that if you're like me and you play multiple classes and you want to gear up for multiple classes, it's maybe better to take the cost effective route on five different classes than to go all in on one singular rifle and not be able to play the other four. The differences are very slight when it comes to gear and only game knowledge will separate how to use that gear and how to make the most out of those potentials. So in the background I just teleported to an area and I activated auto run with the V key. Again you can keybind this to anything. The next tip is about toggling character overhead displays which in this case shows my alliance or guild but you can also set it to show HP and photon points of other players. This is really useful if you play more of a supportive role and want to heal other players and know when to optimally heal them. I personally like having the alliance overhead because it's fun to mess with alliance members when I see them out in the wild. To access the quick menu, I believe the default bind is the end key, but in the keybind settings you can set this to anything, even on controller. I really like the alliance overhead display because it makes making friends and building rapport with other regulars in your block, regular players, gaming with other people, it makes that a lot easier and I strongly recommend you apply to an alliance. Mine is currently full right now and we are not doing applications anymore, and we are going to open up the community alliance in the future. So now in the background, I went to a world mag. If everybody in a region feeds this absolute unit some food, I recommend feeding it food that you do not find valuable because you typically use food to temporarily boost your stats. So what I think the most valuable stat boost is, is increasing weak point damage. Pretty much anything that increases weak point damage, do not feed to this mag. You want to save that for yourself. And look at him. He's happy just to have anything. Okay, fine. I'm feeding him weak point food. I, I can't resist. Sega, if you make the merch, I will buy it. Anyway, if everyone in the region feeds this mag, you get a boost to EXP and rare drop rate. So you want to get 400 contribution points, which you get for just feeding it food. As you can see on the screen, I am completing my daily quest. These give you a giant chunk of EXP daily, so make sure that you're turning them in on the class that you want to over level 20. When I say over level 20, know that the level cap is 20, so you can't go over that, but if you get enough experience to go to what would be level 21, you get an EX cube as a reward for doing that. And if you take this EX cube, you can use it in the item lab to upgrade your final weapon potential, to make your weapon hit as hard as it possibly can. Now I know this is information overload, I'm talking a lot, but pay attention to this next one because it is crucially important to saving you a lot of time. Once you hit level 20, there are no level 20 creatures out in the wild. As a result of level 15 being the highest level creature out in the wild, you only get 1 EXP per kill, which is pitiful. So know that your main source of experience comes from doing urgent quest and daily quest. Hence why I recommend that for the daily quest, you save them for your level 20 of choice. Additionally, as you progress in the story in the later missions, you will find very valuable subquests with EXP rewards of 100,000. So save these for after reaching level 20 so you can get a head start on collecting EX cubes. Another tip in the same category is to double dip when upgrading another subclass. For the record, I currently main a ranger with a subclass of force. Your main class can reach level 20, but your subclass caps at level 15. So in order to get your subclass all the way to level 20, all you have to do is switch your subclass to a main class. Although this isn't necessary because you only get the stats of your main class. However, with a very specific boss fight, you might want to swap your subclass around or your main class around because you can play any class on any character. I hate to do this back to back, but this is really important information here. Listen up, because this is real life money to fix this mistake. Listen, once you set your skills, you cannot reset them unless you have a skill reset pass, which you can pay real money for, or you can wait for them to be randomly distributed by Sega, which does happen from time to time. As an example, let's say that you play Ranger Main with a Fighter subclass. Optimally, you only want to take two perks on the skill tree. 
you want to ignore everything else because they only apply to a main class. So if later I wanted to main class a fighter, I would be missing 90% of the skill tree. There is a solution though that doesn't require any real life money. In PSO, you're allowed to create three different characters for free. So what you can do is make three separate characters. One where you use fighter as a subclass and another where you use fighter as a main class. Yes, you have to get them both to level 20, but the thing is you have to do that anyway and the skill points you unlock are account bound. So they're automatically there. As a personal note from a veteran player, I find it much more enjoyable to play this game with multiple characters for the sheer fact that I can make each character have slightly different fashion that fits the theme of the character. For my ranger, I went with small waifu, big raifu. For my teker, I went for a maid tank, like she's literally indestructible. For my bow braver, that's a class that doesn't exist in NGS yet, I made her have a lot of bows, a rainbow, a bow on her head, a bow and arrow, all the above. So you can work like that if you want to play different characters. So if you want to quickly level a subclass, first get your main to 20 and then pick any subclass. For example, you can choose a level 1 fighter with a level 20 ranger. Then when an urgent quest or daily quest or subquest that gives a lot of EXP pops up, simply do that quest and your subclass will level from like 1 to 8 immediately. And you can do everything like that to level your subclass. Once it's at 15, trade the subclass to now your main class, so instead of going Ranger Fighter, I'm now Fighter Ranger, and then start grinding EXP that way. And I strongly recommend Ranger as your power level in class because it's so easy to mob with. So that brings me to one of the most asked questions I ever get in the stream, which is which character should I start with? And the answer is, you can choose any of them. This is a new game, there is not an established meta, and most of the classes have very similar damage values and team contribution. However, as the meta emerges, I think I'm onto something here, and you're not gonna like the answer. I think every player should subclass a ranger at some point in their career. The reason is because of what you see on screen. This is an attack called homing dart, where you hold the button down, spin in a circle, and it hits everything in the room. You don't even have to look at the screen to get some decent EXP from mobbing. The second reason, and this is the part that you're gonna find filthy, you can mark resources with your weak bullet with your blight round that other players in the area can see. Yeah, I'm raising my voice for this one. If every player in NGS today switches to a ranger when you start gathering resources, you are helping the server out by marking where the resources are so that new players can more easily find them. To accomplish this, level up your Blight Round skill to level 5 so that you have a 10 second cooldown. Then you have 3 weak bullets to mark resources, wait 10 seconds, and do it again. Speaking of farming resources, there is an optimal way to route your resource farming and there are maps that show every resource location that exists. So that will be linked in the description below. Again, always shouting out the PSO community when they make something awesome. Another popular question is, should I play PSO2 Classic? The answer is, yeah. And pardon my French, sorry Sega. PSO2 Classic fucking slaps. This game holds up. It is still just as good as it was yesterday. So to access PSO2 Classic, go to a Ryuker device, that's the teleportation device, move block and you'll see at the very top it says transfer to pso2 block and the first thing to notice is the treasure shop attendant this has some very rare cosmetics that you can buy on pso2 classic and then use on ngs look there's a body stocking today i probably bought that like eight months ago but there you go 800,000 masetta and that is a currency in classic to earn the currency play the game there are still plenty of quests that sell valuable items. There are plenty of guides for PSO2 Classic, and I will probably make a master guide if you enjoy these kind of videos. So the background gameplay is just going to shift to me uh, shooting some stuff in the background of PSO2 Classic while I talk about some of the benefits. And the main benefit is that you can buy old cosmetic items from Classic. For example, there was a Konosuba collab. Yeah, an anime. On Japan's side, there was an Attack on Titan collab. For my fighting game fans, Guilty Gear Strive just launched, and believe it or not, there was a Guilty Gear collab in the past with PSO2 Classic. So you can still obtain those items by going to the player shop and searching specifically for that item. 
One of my favorite emotes in the game is Dance 20, and that'll run you a cool 400 mil. But don't be intimidated by that number because that is actually attainable in PSO2, especially if you start taking the endgame content very seriously. And for the record, I have tried my hardest to get good at this game for over a year, and I still suck. The content still kicks my ass. So, if you're a really hardcore player and want a game that bites back, PSO2 Classic does have that content. So with that being said, I pretty much ran out of segues, so I'm just going to rapid fire a bunch of miscellaneous tips. When harvesting resources, two dropkicks will immediately mine any ores. If you focus a side quest, it will add markers and waypoints in the game. So if you have a daily that says, harvest resources in North Alio, if you focus that task, it will physically show you where the resources are. Multi-weapons take the augments of the main weapon. Turn off motion blur. And you can share your location with your party via the quick menu. So if you tell your friends, hey, I'm over here, and they can't find you, go to the quick menu and share your location, and they will find you because you will be marked on the map. One of my biggest regrets in PSO2 Classic is that I didn't make enough content. I focused more as a player because I waited eight years to play PSO2 Classic. It originally dropped in the year 2012, and it dropped for the entire world in the year 2020 in the language of English. So I finally got to experience it. However, they combined eight years of content into one single year of gameplay before New Genesis launched. As a result, I focused more on playing the game, making memories with friends, and enjoying the game than I did making content. So in New Genesis, now that we're at a normal game pace, I will be making a lot of content. I'll just be talking about ranger rotations and various things. I don't want to make a ranger guide because someone has already done that perfectly. I couldn't improve it if I tried. So for aspiring rangers out there, I linked a guide in the description below. I will probably make meme videos, I will probably just show me doing a quest of my alliance members. We always say something stupid and something funny it always happens in voice chat. Or when we're just hanging out in the lobby, someone with a wild costume pops up and it catches everyone off guard. And we crack up laughing, so maybe a clip like that will be on the YouTube channel. In other words, I will be covering this game properly as a content creator, and I'm excited about that. I hope you enjoyed the video. I stream very often, especially PSO2. I stream a little bit of Destiny, and I will eventually stream some Guilty Gear once I get my bearings with that game. I'm ending the video with a shout out. Shout out to Nathan, Fred, Saccharin, Bemo, JJ Dragon. Y'all have been fantastic. I mean, think about it. This last year, a pandemic, a global crisis, and yet here we are, gaming, making lifelong friends, enjoying ourselves. Thank you. Don't let your hard work go unnoticed. Seriously. Thank you.